Welcome to the All Around Joe Podcast, where we optimize your human performance from my personal experience as an athlete, coach, and all-around self a junkie. On this edition of the All Around Joe Podcast, I am super excited to have special guest Evan DeMarco. Evan is a CBD and fish oil expert that I am incredibly excited to talk to today. Evan is a sports medicine and nutrition expert, published author, and public speaker with interests in diet, health, and supplements. And his company, Omax Health, has some really cool, interesting products. So we're going to get into talking with Evan here in just a second. But first, I want to let you know this podcast is brought to you by Inside Tracker. Inside Tracker is the blood testing company that helped me to figure out how to optimize my body in a way that I couldn't have figured out myself. All right. What you do with Inside Tracker, you go to insidetracker.com, make sure you use the code all around you to get yourself 10% off. And then you buy one of the packages. Any of the packages are good to go. I usually do the ultimate package, but you can do any of them that are, will fit your financial space right now. Any of them will work. Uh, then you will go and set up a blood test with a company that is called Quest Diagnostics in your area. Super easy. You show up and it's usually about 15 minutes from the time that you show up to the time that you're out of there. It's very quick and easy. Then in a few days, Inside Tracker will send you an email and it will tell you that your blood results are ready. You can go and review where you're at with your blood results. And then Inside Tracker will give you recommendations on how to update your diet, supplementation, and lifestyle in order to optimize the blood results that you got. It's super cool. You just follow along. They even have daily check-ins for you so that you're checking in on meeting your goals to optimize your blood every single day. Then you will go and I do to usually redo tests every three to six months to see how things are moving forward. And it's just a way of keeping a check on how you're improving. And the cool thing is the first time I did Inside Tracker, it asked me to eat more carbohydrates and get rid of red meat. And what I what happened was I lost 10 pounds of body fat in the first month and increased my energy. So it was nuts. It was really cool. People were asking me, whoa, what are you doing? I was like, wow, I'm actually eating more carbs. Weird stuff, right? So if you'd like to try out Inside Tracker, I recommend everybody does it. They can afford it. Uh, go to insidetracker.com and use the code all around Joe. That's insidetracker.com and use the code all around Joe. All right. The other company I want to mention today is Recover Mattress at recovermattress.com. These mattresses are designed for athletes. All right. If you feel like you probably are not sleeping well enough, which you probably are not, most of us aren't, <laughs> um, go check out recovermattress.com. And the cool thing about them is not only that they're designed for athletes like you and I, but they have given me a 50% off code all around Joe. I believe it has to be all caps too. So go get yourself a recover mattress at half price by using the code all around Joe, optimize your sleep, feel better, think better, all this fun stuff. And let me know, let me know how it goes. So without further ado, let's hop right into this podcast with Evan DeMarco. I cannot wait. Here we go. Evan, how's it going today? I'm well, man. How you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing really good. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I've been doing a bunch of research and following you for a while, but I would like to jump right in here and let my listeners and viewers know a little bit more about you. So I love digging in and knowing, you know, where, where were you born? Where, how'd you grow up? What got you to where you are today? How did you get interested in the supplement industry and fitness in general? So give it to us. All right. All great questions. So I guess we'll go way back in time. Uh, I was born in Colorado and spent most of my life there. I live in uh, California now, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I grew up as kind of the, the beginning of the Nintendo generation, but I, I, I always laugh right now as I look at video gamers and like how these people are sitting in front of computer screens or TV screens for hours on end. And like, we had Super Mario Brothers, right? So it's like you play Super Mario Brothers, you'd be done in seven minutes, and then you had to go outside and play. And so my whole life was really based around sports. It was baseball was kind of my big one, but I played everything under the sun. And that kind of got me through high school. It got me through, you know, parts of college. You know, I was a professional athlete. So sports had always really been the thread of my existence, the thread of my life. And then like all, you know, adults, I, I you know, college is over and I went, not, went out into the real world and got like a banker's job and put on my three-piece suit every day. And, and I hated every freaking minute of it. 
uh, you know, my, my dad, who's, who's absolutely just a great guy, was a cabinet maker, you know, owned a cabinet company. And so I kind of saw that manual labor that he did every single day and how he would come home like covered in sawdust. And, and I'm like, oh, I don't want that. I want to be like in an office with a tie and I want people to bring me stacks of paperwork. And I, I thought that was cool. And then when I got that job, I'm like, this sucks. Like, I want to be playing. I want to be outside. I want to work. You know, I want to, uh, I want to break a sweat. Um, so after the mortgage collapse, uh, really kind of brought the whole Wall Street, uh, you know, experiment to an end. I found myself just kind of bouncing around, consulting, doing a lot of different things on the business development side. And this company, uh, which was a sports nutrition company, got a hold of me and they basically said, hey, we're looking for business development help. We're looking for, you know, kind of the skill set that I had acquired in at Wall Street. And I'm like, oh, well, this is great. I get to work with athletes. I get to work in the sports nutrition world. Um, and I really dug in and I, I just found my passion. And ultimately what I discovered is from the business side, things were great, but I wanted to get into product development. I wanted to really understand what it took to take a product from concept to the consumer. And I didn't have the scientific backing for that. So I'm like, I got to go back to school. So I started studying like biochemistry and organic chemistry and all the things that no one should ever want to study. Uh, <laughs> and I loved it. It was awesome. Uh, so I would, you know, I'd go to school at night and then I would bring my notes from school into the lab and I'd start talking to the lab guys and they freaking hated me. Yeah, like coming in with just this giant list of uh, questions to, you know, on everything from like, well, can I do this? Can I do this? And they're like, kid, get out of here. Uh, but it <laughs> gave me a really cool crash course in product development. And from there, I was able to really kind of parlay that into a, a very long and successful career in developing everything from, you know, sports nutrition products, dietary supplements, uh, pharmaceutical products. Uh, so it really became this great hybrid of the marketing piece of, of what I really love to do in the business development and then pairing that with, you know, really understanding what the modern needs are of the average person, whether you're an athlete or just someone looking to get healthy and then be able to create products that, uh, you know, that kind of address all of those needs. Yeah, absolutely. Let's dig in a little bit into your athletic background, because I'm sure that that had something that stemmed into what you're doing now. What were you a professional athlete doing? Uh, you know, I, I played minor league baseball and I was a professional boxer. Really? Yeah. How, how did those two things come together? Uh, you know what? <laughs> life is, life is kind of one of those great things, right? If you're open to the potential of things, you know, the possibilities just drop into your lap. Uh, but I was, you know, I kind of grew up doing martial arts as just a way to stay in shape. Okay. Uh, and I loved it. And this was back like, this was karate. This was before MMA. This was before Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I was literally like American Kenpo karate. And I loved it though. It was great. And they had like these competitions, you know, it was more of like the old karate kid movie type of stuff. It wasn't like <laughs> beat someone into submission where they tap out. It was, you know, get one point reset, get one point reset. Um, and I had a, a moderate degree of success in that one. And someone found me and said, Hey, I'm putting on a professional boxing match. Would you be interested in doing this? I'm like, oh yeah, sure. You know, I'm, I'm, I was young. I was like 18 at the time. I'm like, yeah, I'll do that. That sounds great. You know, like, you know, give me a couple hundred bucks. I'll go let someone punch me in the face. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's exactly what happened. I, I ended up, uh, my first fight was with a undefeated fighter from Las Vegas. I was in Colorado at the time and he just whooped my ass. <laughs> It was like, wait a sec, that, I, I was expecting to, you know, come out and be like, you know, I'm young, I, you know, I, I've got youth and vitality on my side. And he's like, yeah, kid, I'm going to, I'm going to school you. And he did. That. <laughs> but it really taught me, um, you know, boxing is, is a difficult sport. It really requires a huge amount of discipline. And boxing is interestingly enough, one of those sports that doesn't play real well with the sport, like with the supplement industry. It's always kind of like, I mean, I think back to like the original Rocky, right? The guy's like drinking raw eggs out of a, a glass. <laughs> yeah. So when we really look at some of those old school sports, they've been really removed from the supplement industry and how supplements can help improve performance. Baseball was a perfect example, right? I mean, as a pitcher, the amount of inflammation that my arm went through on a consistent basis was pretty prolific. I could have been looking at some really cool supplements to help control that inflammation. And yeah. by and large, we didn't really recognize the value of supplements at the time. So it was like, throw some ice on it after you're done pitching a game and then, you know, come back a couple of days later and do the same thing over again. But when we start to really understand the physiology and the complex makeup of what we put ourselves through as athletes, supplements have a huge role in addressing a lot of those chronic issues that keep people, uh, 
you know, or basically force people out of sports a lot earlier than they could be if they were really addressing supplements as a, as a means to kind of handling some of those inflammation issues. Sure. And that's super interesting stuff that I'd like to dive into more. But before I do that, did you, you said you went back to school yeah, and dove into some of these really technical uh, subjects and then, so like, how did that evolve? So did you go, cause I've heard some, some interviews with you and been following you and you are an encyclopedia of this stuff, man. Like you <laughs> know it inside and out. And I've taken, you know, some of those biochemistry courses and things. And how did that progress? You said you loved it. And then did you go and get like a PhD in this stuff or did you just sell, start it and then self-taught and just dive down the rabbit hole? You know, the, no, I, I did not go back and get the PhD. I actually just took the classes um, that I felt would be beneficial to understanding what I needed to understand to be efficient at, you know, at product development, at understanding, you know, human biology, human biochemistry. Um, so it, it was really kind of a take the education opportunity that was available and then apply that to real world, real, real world settings. So then I ended up doing a lot of research with some of the companies that I was working with, but yeah, never went down the PhD road. I, I literally just took those classes, took what I, I needed to, and then, um, you know, applied that to all of the workings that I was doing. So I, it became a, a real, you know, just create the foundation and then use that foundation to go out and fundamentally understand what I was doing. And so I got to really work on some cool research stuff. I was part of research and development, some clinical work. Um, and in doing such, you really, you know, there's a real disconnect between the academic side of things and the practical application of things. And, and so I, it's kind of like anything, you, you get the education and then you go out and you get real dirty in the real world. And, and that's what I've been doing. Yeah, which is awesome. What made you decide to go after the, well, let me step back. What I've done the research and what I've been following you with is fish oil and the CBD industry. Um, what made you decide to go after those specific products? And are there, is there more to it than that, that I just haven't seen that it just kind of led you in that direction? So actually what I was doing is I was developing prenatal vitamins. Um, okay. And I, I had ended up working with a, a division of the American College of OBGYNs. And I was kind of working on prenatal vitamins somewhat dispassionately. I'm like, oh, this is, this is a fun project, but I don't really, you know, it's prenatal vitamins. What do, what do I care? Um, and then I found out I was going to be a dad. And so then I'm like, oh, okay. And so this entire time that I'd been working on prenatal vitamins, I'd been doing it from a delivery system aspect. I wanted to take prenatal vitamins and put them in a drinkable form okay. so that compliance stayed higher, so that women, more women were taking their prenatal vitamins. And a lot of the big complaints with prenatal is that they're too big. They upset my stomach. So you just end up with people not taking them as regularly as they should. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to kind of switch the whole paradigm up. It's let's make prenatal vitamins easier. And then I'm like, oh, wow, I'm going to be a dad. So then I started really looking at prenatal vitamins. I'm like, it's not the drinkable component. It's the fact that prenatal vitamins really suck. Mm -hmm. They haven't changed in the last 30 years. The same prenatal that my mom was taking is the same thing you can buy on the shelf right now. So what I really wanted to do was understand uh, fetal brain development, infant brain development, and in doing such, I created a product uh, called Alpha and Omega, which is a combination of high concentrate DHA and alpha glycerol phosphocholine, which based off of some uh, uh, European Food Safety Agency study uh, indicated that those were the predominant sources of breast milk for DHA and for choline. So when we look at fetal brain development, when we look at infant brain development, and when we look at our, how our brains develop, over the course of like the first two or three years, these two constituent parts of breast milk really are the catalyst for some of the biggest brain growth that we have as human beings. So I'm like, oh, this is kind of cool. So then I actually turned that into a prenatal vitamin. Um, and, and in doing such, I really kind of got into the whole omega uh, industry and really learned a lot about it and learned that not all fish oil is created equal. And that was kind of the big misconception is, you know, in all of the work that I've done, I'm like, oh, it's just fish oil. We just get it. And, you know, it's fish oil. And then you really start to peel back the layers and you're like, wow, there's a lot of difference between the stuff that you're going to buy at Costco and, and the really good stuff that you can get uh, at other places. Yeah, absolutely. And if anybody wants to check out your episode with Barbell Shrugged on fish oil, I'll put a link to that in the show notes at allaroundjoe.com slash 159. So I recommend that they you go check that out. But how did that lead into CBD then? 
Great question. So, you know, as we kind of look at the extraction technology for omegas and how omegas are, or, you know, how omegas go from just fish oil coming out of fish, you know, uh, to the consumer, that extraction technology to concentrate up fish oil to the higher levels that we really want to have is the same that we need to actually separate out THC from CBD or full spectrum phytocannabinoids. Mm -hmm. So it became this really interesting extension of technology that I had already been working uh, towards. And it, it's kind of funny, right? I really talk a lot about this in some other podcasts, but CBD, when I first heard of CBD, it's like, oh, that came from the hemp plant. That's part of, you know, cannabis sativa. So being an athlete or spending all this time growing up in sports, I'm like, that's a drug, not going anywhere near it. Yep. And <laughs> it took me about six months of hardcore research to really understand that this is not a drug. This is actually a really cool therapeutic opportunity for so many people to address so many different things. Um, so it, it just kind of in looking at the whole thing, I was really got excited about the technology that it, you know, that it takes to take CBD from, you know, fibers found in this, uh, this uh, industrial hemp to the consumer. So it, it's, um, it, it's, it's part of it, it's just the technology. Part of it is the synergies between fish oil and, and CBD and how they impact the endocannabinoid system. And part of it is just that there's a lot of things that CBD can do, and we're just starting to understand how that's working, what it looks like, and what the potential is for it. So it's just an exciting time in the whole CBD world. Okay, cool. Can you explain to us how, number one, like, what is the general, what is CBD question, I guess? What is CBD for those people? Because I, I get this question a lot, and I'm not an expert in it. But uh, I would love to hear how you explain to the layperson that comes up to you and says, hey, you know what CBD is. What is it? Another great question. So CBD is one of 113 unique phytocannabinoids that come from industrial hemp. The two most prevalent of those phytocannabinoids are THC and CBD. But you have all of these other ones, these, you know, the CBDA, the CBDBs, you know, all of these different phytocannabinoids. Um, when we really look at the spectral analysis of industrial hemp and we find these 113 unique phytocannabinoids, THC and CBD are the most prevalent. THC is the thing that's going to get you high. It's the psychoactive. You know, if you end up at 7-Eleven at 3 a.m. searching for nachos, that's because of THC. That's not because of CBD. <laughs> um, and those two are actually antagonistic to each other. So this, when we remove the THC to the legally compliant levels in the United States, which is 0.3% or less, we find that CBD really has this whole host of therapeutic benefit uh, on the endocannabinoid system. And the endocannabinoid system is an uh, endogenous lipid receptor system in the body that controls a lot of different things like um, appetite, sleep regulation, uh, inflammation, um, mood. So there's all of these really cool things that it does. And, and when we support that with these full spectrum phytocannabinoids, then we really start to see some cool things. I mean, like, I, I've been working on a sleep study for a while with CBD and the comparison of CBD to melatonin is like night and day. People are like, people are passing out on CBD and sleeping for like eight hours and you know having the most deep restful sleep of their lives. Uh, something that melatonin has never really been able to provide. Whoa, that's super interesting. And so how CB, okay, so CBD and THC, right? You still got me? I got gotcha. you. Okay. TBD, CBD and THC are part of the endocannabinoid system. I have a kinesiology degree with emphasis of fitness, nutrition, and health. Why did I never hear about this system? <laughs> that is an awesome question. And the answer to that is I have no freaking clue. Um, <laughs> Honestly, like the, the endocannabinoid system is something that we're really just starting to understand. I think we've always known about it. We knew that it was there, but it was kind of like the spleen, right? You're like, what the hell does this do? No one actually knew what the endocannabinoid system uh, did, what it was good for, how it really synergistically worked with the central nervous system, uh, and, and how it really the CB1 and CB2 receptors played really important and vital roles in our general health and wellness. So I think kind of like the spleen, it was just like, okay, well, we've got this, we don't know what it does, so we're not gonna focus on it. Now that we've been able to really look at the CBD research and a lot of the research that's coming out of Europe where the compliance or the regulatory environment is a little bit more lax than it is here, uh, we're starting to see some research that says, wow, there's some pretty cool things that this endocannabinoid system does. 
And, and again, I, I look at stress and sleep, the stress sleep cycle. Um, I, I, when I do, when I do talks on this one, the first, you know, I'll ask this question is what's the first thing that most people do when they wake up in the morning? And if you go back 10 years, I think the, the average, you know, the average answer was, well, I get up and I go to the bathroom. Now, 90% of the people that I survey at some of these, at some of these talks that I do are like, oh, I check my phone. So, <laughs> And that is that's so sad, but it's a comment on on the society that we've created. So you wake up and you check your phone. And not only do you have that instant blue light activation where, you, you know, all of a sudden cortisol and prolactin levels are increasing, but what are you doing? You're checking Facebook or Instagram, or you're looking at your email. So you're not giving your body the appropriate amount of time to jump into the day, to, you know, ease into a day with like a routine you're just starting off your day at high levels of stress and anxiety. You know, it's like your boss is pissed at you. You missed a party last night that all of your friends were posting on Facebook. It's like, whatever the case is, that singular, uh, that singular uh, device has created so much anxiety and that carries forward all through the day. So your day starts out stressed out. Your day starts out stressed. You go through your day all amped up. You know, you're turning to coffee or Red Bull or energy drinks. So then you get home at night and, the follow-up question uh, on all of this is what is the last thing most people do before they go to bed? It's check their phone. Exactly. So now you've got blue light activation. You're not sleeping as well. You're taking all of that stress and anxiety with you. And so people are just amped up. They're not sleeping well. They're not recovering well. Our bodies are fundamentally just being destroyed uh, by this kind of sleep stress cycle. So CBD really seems to have a pretty profound impact in addressing that. People are going through their days with lower cortisol levels, low, lower prolactin levels, they're sleeping better at night and then they're breaking that cycle. So they wake up a little bit, you know, more chill in the morning. Uh, and then they're able to kind of work through their day being a little less stressed out with a little less anxiety. And so they sleep better. And when you kind of start breaking that cycle, we're starting to see what CBD uh, can do to help people just kind of deal with the pace of life that we've set for ourselves. Sure, sure. Do you know how the CBD is actually working? Like what the, the effects are going on in the body? Yeah, so there's a couple of different, well, the short answer is yes. The long answer is we're still really trying to peel back the layers of the research on this one. So there's two different receptors. There's the CB1 and the CB2 receptors. The CB1 receptors are predominantly located in the brain and then the CB2 receptors are kind of located uh, throughout the body. Okay. When we take CBD and it impacts the CB1 receptors in the brain, we're addressing things like uh, mood, appetite, stress. Um, we're actually looking at neural inflammation. So all the things that just kind of get you amped up and, you know, things that, you know, when we really looked at, at cognitive decline and brain issues over an extended period of time, the CB1 receptors seem to really be responsive to CBD in the brain. The CB2 receptors are controlling things like pain, uh, inflammation, things like that. So, CBD or full spectrum phytocannabinoids is impacting the body in two different ways. It's working with all of the stuff in the brain on the CB1 receptors and then all of the stuff in the body with the CB2 receptors. So if you're, you know, if you've got chronic pain from like joint injuries or from sports injuries or things like that, you take a CBD uh, supplement, you're not only going to have kind of the brain benefits, but then you're just going to feel better physically as you go to sleep. So a lot of those inflammation issues that might keep you up at night are just things that you might not notice as you get older, a little bit of pain in the knees, the, the elbows, whatnot. Uh, those things kind of start to subside a little bit. At least that's what we're seeing from a lot of the people taking this stuff. Okay. Very interesting stuff. And I, I since I have you here, I had somebody tell me that TH, or I'm sorry, that CBD works better with THC. Is that true or not true? Uh, it's debatable. Now, typically they're antagonistic of each other, so they kind of cancel each other out. Yeah. Now, one of the other things that we're seeing too is that all hemp is being bioengineered, right? It's, you know, if you look back in time, 5,000 years ago, uh, you know, hemp was used as kind of one of the oldest therapeutic compounds on the planet. It was used in China. It was used in India. Uh, it's funny. George Washington grew this stuff in his front yard. Uh, at one point in the United States history, it was illegal to not grow hemp. Uh, and it, it so, so many things came with it, right? It was fibers for rope, clothing. Um, I, I mean, there's so many things that this plant can do. Then the cotton industry comes along and they recognize that hemp is the biggest com competitor for cotton. And so we kind of, you know, really marginalized hemp uh, through 
capital, uh, you know, capital requirements. So the cotton industry kind of pushes hemp out. <laughs> then in the 1930s, in this weird reverse immigration policy, what we ended up doing was demonizing marijuana. Mm. And so in the state of California, what they wanted to do was give cops and the government a way to export Mexicans back to Mexico. So what they said, and this is kind of like verbatim written in the law, is that Mexican men were coming across the border smoking marijuana, which is basically the Spanish word for, uh, for hemp, and getting high and soliciting sex from white women. I mean, that was literally verbatim what was written in the law. So <laughs> all of a sudden, marijuana becomes demonized. It becomes illegal. And then that, that ruling was later overturned by the Supreme Court. But in the 1960s, the DEA reclassified uh, marijuana as a Schedule I drug, the same as cocaine or heroin or opium. Um, and the interesting thing is, is at that time, those plants had never really been bioengineered. So the THC and the CBD concentrations were relatively low, four, okay. five, six percent. Now they're being bioengineered to really jack up the THC or jack up the CBD levels. And so we're seeing THC coming out of, coming out of uh, certain plants that are like 20, 30, 40 percent. So that same high that everyone was getting at Berkeley in the 1960s, that's completely different. I mean, you take, you take THC from you know, bioengineered plants now and compare that to the 60s, people are just getting whacked out of their gourd. <laughs> so the long answer to your question is, is that they are relatively antagonistic to each other in proper ratios. But since we bioengineered these plants, it's really hard to say what the human body should be doing with higher concentrations of TB THC compared to the lower concentrations of CBD or vice versa. Okay. Okay. And next question is how does full spectrum come into all of this? I've seen that a lot pop up. Yeah. So that's when we really look at the legal component of it is, is that to sell CBD in the United States right now, it has to be full spectrum phytocannabinoids. Okay. And the only way to do that is, you know, to get that from the industrial hemp. What we find is that there seems to be a lot of therapeutic value in the full spectrum component versus just the isolates. And recently the GW Corporation out of England got their the first FDA approval for a CBD based product called Epidiolex, which is used to treat childhood epilepsy. And that is a CBD isolate. So, you know, this is really gonna tee up a very interesting conversation of does full spectrum belong as a dietary supplement or is it a pharmaceutical product? And uh, that's going to be an interesting conversation in the next 12 to 24 months. Okay. And what are your thoughts? Oh, I think uh, big pharma is going to make every play they can for this industry and they're probably going to win. Yeah. Yeah. It's the dietary supplement industry can't compete with big pharma. So I, I think right now our job is to make sure that the average consumer understands that full spectrum phytocannabinoids do include CBD and that, you know, there is a lot of therapeutic benefit to be gained from, from that. So in the event that the FDA eventually rules against dietary supplements and they say you can't put CBD on a label, that the average consumer knows that full spectrum does mean that. So my question was that if Big Pharma comes in and pushes people around, then will CBD just be able to be sold by these pharmaceutical companies? Yeah, so so this kind of there, there's a couple different ways that this could go. Um, if you're there's two different pharmaceutical omega products called Bavaza and Vasepa, and for the most part, that element of the pharmaceutical industry has stayed independent of the dietary supplement industry with omegas. So they've kind of been able to coexist pretty well without any major legal issues. Uh, we can hope that that's the way that CBD and full spectrum phytocannabinoids are going to go. Most likely, it's going to go the way of red yeast rice and lavazostat. And so I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago, red yeast rice was kind of a big product that hit the market. And it had a naturally occurring lavazostat in it, which is something that the, the pharmaceutical products sell to help lower cholesterol. So when the dietary supplement industry was testing this, they found these naturally occurring lavazostatins in the product. And so they started putting that on the supplement facts panel. And that's where Big Pharma was like, oh, hell no. Uh, so they started the ultimate battle royale with, you know, big pharma dietary supplement. And of course, big pharma ended up winning. Hmm. What we know now is, is that obviously those naturally occurring products exist in red yeast rice. And so for the most part, what the red yeast rice companies were doing was trying to educate the consumers that they can get that from their product without having to get a prescription for our, the pharmaceutical product. I think ultimately that's the way that it's going to go. I think that 
we're going to, uh, you know, we're going to legalize it with the passage of the hemp farm bill, which is supposed to be voted on basically any day now. CBD will ultimately be legal for a short amount of time, and then, uh, then the big, then pharmaceutical companies are going to start filing their new drug applications for CBD-based products. And so, what we'll ultimately have to do is say that industrial hemp or full-spectrum hemp oil contains CBD, and the average consumer is just going to have to recognize that they're getting CBD with it, but it's not going to appear on a label. And then big pharma is probably going to start working on specific isolates or specific combinations of things. And that's another thing that we're finding is with the technology, the same technology that we talked about earlier in the podcast about how omegas are you know, separated through this technology. When we start pulling apart these 113 unique phytocannabinoids, we can put them back together in really cool ways to tackle indication specific response. Things like you know, very specific for sleep, for stress, for anxiety, for opioid addiction this is a huge one there's a lot of people a lot of medical doctors who are talking about using full spectrum hemp with cbd to help people uh to break the basically to break their opioid uh, addictions um so some really cool stuff that's going on with that pain is a big one um traumatic brain injury i know i uh, was at nate jackson the former denver bronco wrote a really interesting book on like brain injury with football players and how cbd is really helping with that so there's a lot of stuff going on as far as how these things can help. And then I think big pharma is obviously gonna be able to fund the technology and the research that we know really how these things work. But it's gonna be kind of exciting to see. It's like, you know, take these, take this whole plant apart, put it back together and then see what we can really do with it. Yeah, it's gonna be an exciting time. Why should our, the athletes that are watching and listening to this, like why should they get excited about CBD? Great question. Um, I think couple, a couple of reasons, right? You know, general post-exercise inflammation is a big thing. You know, you, you go to the gym, you beat up your muscles, um, you need to recover or you need to resolve that inflammation. What we're finding is sarcopenia, age-related muscle protein breakdown, is happening younger and younger. Now, is that a result of environmental toxicity? Is that a result of our diets? Is that a result of, of you know, a number of different things? We're not 100% certain. But where we used to see sarcopenia in people who are like in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, we're starting to see it in people who are, you know, as early as their 20s. <laughs> what I think my hypothesis on this is, is that a lot of it has to do with the omega-6 to omega-3 ratios. Okay. So if we go back in time, you know, 200 years, we noticed that the average omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is about four to one. And omega-6s are great, uh, as are omega-3s, but when omega-6s, especially in, you know, when we get them things from when we get them in things from like corn oil, trans fat, all of the bad stuff that we're eating, they become hyper pro-inflammatory. So let's say you go to the gym and you don't necessarily have the best diet, you've got a lot of omega-6 in your diet. You're gonna work out and you're not going to repair muscle as well as you should. So I think CBD really, when you pair that with like branch chain amino acids, when you pair that with polyunsaturated fatty acids is really helping people recover and stave off that sarcopenia. So we're seeing better muscle protein synthesis. We're seeing better recovery times and we're seeing better muscle growth from athletes in the gym. Just generally, you know, looking at that neural inflammation and how those chemicals are released into our body to help our bodies recover. Uh, CBD seems to have a pretty big impact for athletes in that capacity. Cool. Yeah. And how do you figure out how much CBD someone should be taking? Another great question, right? So these are, dude, you're loaded with them today. Uh, I've just, I've just gone down this issue where I'm like, <laughs> ah, you know, how much should I be taking? Well, let's see, let's try and amp it up or take it down or, you know, and I, I'm trying to always look for things that I can measure, right? If I can measure it, then I know that it's working. And sometimes you, it's hard to measure it. Like if I just feel like I sleep better, but you know, my sleep app doesn't really change all that much, but I sleep better. So yeah. I want to hear Those are anecdotal, right? It's the end of one. If you wake up in the morning after taking it for a week, you're like, wow, I, I really am sleeping better. That's a good place to start. Um, yeah. To answer that question, let's talk about delivery systems first. So I, I think, you know, with CBD, you see the tinctures, which are just the liquid droppers. You see like things like gummies, you see chocolate bars. I'm not a big fan of those for a couple of reasons. One, it's inconsistent delivery. So you never know, you know, most of those tinctures are mixed with maybe it's coconut oil or you know, olive oil or something like that. So you can have phase separation in that. The CBD can actually separate from the other oil. So if you're not shaking it up properly or if you've got that kind of separation, well, day one, you might get 10 milligrams. Day two, you might get 50 milligrams. 
So the inconsistency in delivery, and especially with things like gummies or chocolate bars, where there's not consistent delivery in that actual gummy or that chocolate bar, uh, leads down a path where you don't exactly know scientifically what it is you're putting in your body every single day. So I like soft gels, things where you know you have content uniformity. Every soft gel is tested. You know that you've got, every soft gel has five milligrams of CBD. Um, the other thing is, is that I think CBD might not necessarily be as bioavailable as a lot of other fat soluble vitamins. So one of the things that I did with, uh, with Omax Health, which is a, a great product uh, that I'm very proud of, is, is I, I bound the CBD with polyunsaturated fatty acids with an omega-3 uh, and theanine. Uh, and I did that. Um, I also added some alpha glycerol phosphocholine. So we actually kind of created this liposomal delivery system within a soft gel. So even though you're only getting five milligrams in a soft gel, the bioavailability is a lot more. Uh, what I suggest is start with a soft gel and start with five milligrams and titrate up from there. If you take five for three or four days and you're like, that did absolutely nothing for me, jump to 10. Um, I, I think the common mistake that a lot of people make, especially athletes are like, oh, I'm big. I'm in the gym. I work out. I'm like, I'm going to take 10 times the average dose. Yeah. Uh, and then you're like, well, uh, best case scenario is it did nothing for you. Worst case scenario is you crapped your pants. Uh, <laughs> and most likely there's going to be some, some kind of variation in between. So, <laughs> My philosophy is always start small and go bigger versus go big or go home philosophy. And uh, so five milligrams seems to be a really cool starting spot and then just kind of go up from there. Okay. And when you're talking with an athlete, what are you asking them to look for when they know where to you know, cap that dose? You know, I think it becomes a point where, you know, there's a law of diminishing returns with CBD and there seems to be this black box, like after 50 to hundred milligrams for some people where they're just not having any efficacy whatsoever. Um, I also look at it from the standpoint of like, if, if you're, if you're overly lethargic, if you're overly sleepy, if you're not waking up very well in the morning, you might be taking too much. Um, so I, I think it's going to be more a physiological response on a day-to-day -day basis where if you're taking too much, you're just going to feel tired versus, you know, kind of going down that road. There was a, there was an interesting Facebook meme I saw the other day and it was like something to the effect of, um, the number of people who have died from overdosing on CBD is now the same as the number of people who have been mauled by unicorns. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, yeah, like, okay. <laughs> at, at this point, from a pure literature perspective, there is no, like, like no one's ever died from overdosing on CBD. Uh, right. And I think the worst case scenario is someone's actually probably just crapped their pants. Okay. Okay. So cool. And can you pop a drug test with CBD? You can. Yes, you absolutely can. And especially if you start taking way more than, than the dose. Now, this brings up two interesting points, right? Is really know where you're getting your CBD from. Yeah. I always tell people is go to reputable companies who have a longevity in the marketplace. Uh, you know, supplement companies who've launched other products, who have not based their entire business model off of this one CBD product. Yeah. CBD, you know, Forbes indicated it's going to be a $3 billion business next year in the United States. Coca-Cola, you know, is, is talking about, you know, launching CBD products. Constellation Brands, which owns Corona Beer, just invested $4 billion into a CBD company in Canada. There is a lot of money on the table with this particular product. And with a lot of money comes the cowboys, the people out just ready to make a quick buck. Yeah. And when you find those people who just, hey, I, I, I made some CBD products. I threw up a website. I'm going to go see if I can make some money you're not finding the same commitment to manufacturing, the same commitment to customer service, the same commitment to just transparency in that product. So look for a company that has some longevity in the marketplace, that's launched other products, that's not just banking their entire future off of a CBD product. Um, then the, the secondary part of that is because the law allows for 0.3% THC in a CBD product or a full spectrum product, if you start taking a lot, then you are getting some THC. So yes, you can test positive for, uh, you know, you can pop a drug test. So again, I always recommend is know what you're putting in your body, you know, make sure, it, you know, the company that's providing it to you is completely transparent and know your state laws, right? I mean, if, if you have random drug tests for work, you know, uh, yeah, th this is gonna be an issue. And this is gonna be one of the things that becomes a real topic of conversation, especially with the passage of the Farm Bill. If this becomes legally approved in all 50 states, how do you address the, the reality that it's legally okay to have 0.3% THC in a CBD product, 
but it might not legally be okay to have THC in your system for a drug test or things like that. You know, right. it's like if a mailman who's a federal employee can't have pot in his system or THC in his system, but now we just federally approved it to sell across all state lines, how do we reconcile all of this? And this becomes the big topic of conversation in the CBD world is, yeah, we want the money. We want to be able to replace tobacco farmers in Kentucky with hemp farmers. That's really the whole goal of the passage of this farm bill. But we haven't figured out how to reconcile a lot of these concerns that are going to come out of people who might be taking two, 300 milligrams of CBD and getting that THC in their system. Yeah, interesting. And just as a you know, talk of, topic of argument, do you believe that it, even the THC matters for these drug tests? Should we just get rid of, rid of the THC limitation in the drug test altogether? I think that, you know, I think there comes a point where you should be able to test, you know, parts per million and look at what a respectable dose is based off of, you know, the limitations of CBD supplementation versus someone who's literally just waking up in the morning and and toking it up or taking mass quantities of THC. So I think there needs to be a litmus test in there. Um, And, and, you know, it, it becomes... I'm not a politician and, and I hate, I, I hate politics. So it, it, it becomes a conversation where I don't know if I have a seat at this table, but scientifically we should be able to say that if you're waking up every single day and you're smoking weed, what is your THC test going to look like? And then we back into some numbers that say, if, if I'm, if I'm suffering from chronic pain, if I've got insomnia, if I've got a prescription uh, or some type of, of, you know, recommendation for a dietary supplement that includes CBD and I'm getting THC, that there should be some limit that, you know, is acceptable for all professions or all drug tests. Okay. And if, if I'm an athlete, let's say that, let's say that I am you and I'm coming to you and I'm going to say, Hey, Evan, I'm this, you know, up and coming or professional athlete what questions should I be asking you or like what documentation should I be asking for from you to know that your CBD product is, you know, legit or potent enough or whatever? Great question. So one of the things that if you're a professional athlete and you are actually in a position where you could be drug tested for, and, and, you know, again, and this is probably true of, of, of any profession, right? If you're going to be drug tested, there are companies that are making non-detectable levels of THC. Okay. It's a lot more expensive. Um, and, and, but if you're really looking for the benefits of CBD, there are products on the market that have non-detectable levels of THC. So my recommendation is you have to find a company. Typically what you're going to find are these are going to be your practitioner brands, like your designs for health, your metagenics, uh, that are making these products. They're going the extra mile to make sure that all of the THC is removed. And then you've got that product. But I also say, if you're going to purchase a product as a professional athlete, or if there's any concern that you might be drug tested, is you want to have all of the documentation. I need a C of A and a spectral analysis that shows that this is 100% non-detectable. Mm-hmm. Um, now, NSF for sport, which is the, uh, the testing agency that, uh, that actually admonishes uh, or validates certain dietary supplement products for use in professional sports, they are looking at CBD. So if you find a company that has an NSF for sport logo on there, then you can kind of rest assured that they've gone through that whole testing process and and that they have the non-detectable levels of THC. Okay. Very cool. So, but then when you're also, you're saying that, yeah, we want to look for that, but then we also want to have something that's going to work really well. It has like a delivery system, like for example, your product. So it, kind of has this double-edged sword where it's like we want it to work and as best as it can and we want it to be non-detectable not pop a drug test exactly and i think that the cbd out there the full spectrum hemp out there that has completely removed the thc is a good product to start with uh one of the other things too is is that it's not a panacea right it, it the problem with cbd is like because there's so much money in it people are saying that it can do everything it's like you know cure cancer. You know, if you've got a missing testicle, grow that back, you know, <laughs> fix baldness. It's like, I, I've heard some crazy things. I'm like, I'm like seriously, like, like who's, who's writing this crap. Um, so understand what it is that you're going to use it for. And then, uh, you know, kind of go down that road accordingly. The thing about CBD is it pairs really well with some other stuff, right? You know, okay. 5-HTP, GABA, Valerian, if you're looking for sleep, you know, take, you know, stack those together. Um, you know, if you're really looking for joint, uh, you know, joint stuff is look at like SOD, extra melon, curcumin, you know, take that with your CBD products. So you can really, you know, if you've got joint injuries, things like that. Um, 
branched chain amino acids, perfect thing to pair with, uh, with CBD, especially for post-workout muscle soreness or for post-workout, uh, you know, sarcopenia. So it's not a panacea. It's not going to fix all of your problems, but if you use it as a base and then start to recognize what it can do for you and start pairing accordingly, then you're going to have some serious benefit from this stuff. Back to the, the THC thing though is, is yeah, it's, it's consistent delivery systems. It's like, don't look at the tinctures or the gummies. If you're going to apply CBD as a real world solution to real world problems, you know, make sure you're, you're actually looking at companies that know how to manufacture this stuff. And typically those are going to be soft gels. Those are going to be, you know, standard delivery systems for dietary supplements. Yeah, man. Do you have any articles on, or do you have any plans to release products that have these mixtures of things that you just mentioned? Because I'm sitting here salivating as I'm listening, like recover better, sleep better, have better joints, you know, with these, these combination of things. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's kind of funny. I was in a product development meeting yesterday and these are the things we were talking about is, is the, uh, the Valerian, the five HTP and the GABA is sleep. Um, that's actually something that I'll be launching probably within the next 60 days. Uh, the SOD and the curcumin product is something that I kind of got excited about, right? It's like, you know, I want better gains in the gym. I want to control that. You know, I want to get better at resolving post-workout inflammation. So that was one looking at SOD extra mel, looking at curcumin, really looking at pairing that with a, a solid BCAA and using fat as an active transport mechanism. So maybe throwing in some like collagen, uh, your type of thing. Like those were products like, wow, you know, we can really start to see some benefit from those. So yeah, those are all things that, uh, that I'll be launching within the next six months. Okay, cool. I'll have to keep in touch with you and hear about those things. Those sound awesome. So oh, dude, I'll definitely send them to you. You can uh, tell me what you think. Yeah, for sure. And before I forget, is there a best time of day to take these CBD products? What I'm finding is that if you take them in the morning and you're kind of controlling some of those stress markers that we talked about, like the, the C-reactive protein, the, the prolactin, the cortisol levels, um, the CBD can be calming without being sedating. So you're kind of managing all of those, you know, those inflammatory and those stress markers throughout the day so that when you get down to the, you know, towards your night, you're much closer or much more ready to, to go to sleep. Um, what we do find there seems to be a little bit of lag in its, its activation. Uh, so if you're taking it at 10 o'clock and you go to bed at 10.30, it's not really going to have an impact. You probably need about two to three hours of that product in your system before it really starts to work. So I'm finding that, you know, take it in the morning. That seems to really have a positive impact on your day and set you up for better sleep at night. Some people are taking it at like seven o'clock at night so that they can go to bed at 10. Um, and, and it's one of those things, each person is unique. There's no silver bullet. There's no, you know, kind of magic formula for every single person. So I would say experiment with it, start in the morning. If it makes you too lethargic, too, you know, drowsy, whatnot, take it at seven o'clock or take it three hours before you want to go to bed. Okay. And what's your thought on cycling on and off with supplements in general, whether it be CBD or I guess we could just focus on CBD, but do you recommend taking these things every day? I know that as someone who sells them, it's like, great. Yeah. Take it every day. But like, what do you think? No, no. And, and I think, you know, nine times out of 10, the, the, you know, the companies that I work with usually want to kick me when I answer this question, but I absolutely do not think you should take everything, uh, take something every single day, especially fat soluble vitamins, like fish oils, like vitamin D's, like vitamin A's, like, like CBD. My general rule of thumb is six weeks on two weeks off okay. uh, and cycle that way. And what you'll find too, especially with CBD is if you go six weeks on it and you take two weeks off, your body's either going to instantly snap back to like, oh my God, I need this. Or you might find that you don't need, you know, you can go longer than two weeks. You can go three or four weeks without taking it because you are starting to, you know, optimize your endocannabinoid system. So you're just in a better place, you know, mentally, physically. Um, my rule of thumb is you need to be able to metabolize fat soluble vitamins and not, not build them up in your system to the point that they become toxic. And I think we are seeing that a lot more these days with people just popping the endless supply of vitamins. You know, give your body the chance to just chill out, relax, you know, reset itself and then get hungry for those vitamins again. If you need them, your body's going to know it. And then once you take them in, it's going to be in a much better place to metabolize those and utilize those vitamins for your benefit. Okay. Very cool answer. Very cool. Um, second to last question. Is there any long-term studies that you've seen on CBD that, you know, I can tell people, Hey, you got to go listen to this podcast because you know, that it's actually safe stuff. No, um, not to the extent that I would like there to be. And, and I think, you know, 
we know that people have been taking CBD products for years, for decades. We know that people have been even smoking marijuana, which has CBD in it, or utilizing some type of marijuana product for decades without any major negative impact whatsoever. Yeah. But from a long-term clinical efficacy study, we don't have that data yet. And I think that uh, because of the legal position of it, because of the regulatory uncertainty of CBD in the United States, it's going to be a long time before we have some really solid concrete data on if you were to take this every single day, what does it do to you? Right. Interesting. Very interesting. I wasn't expecting that. I was expecting someone to have like done it in their basement and, you know, in U- USC and hidden it from somebody, even though it was illegal. <laughs> No, I, I mean, th- there's definitely been a lot of research on it, right? I mean, we know what this stuff does, but, you know, then you get into this whole academic versus, you know, reality thing. It's like, has anyone done a double blind placebo controlled FDA approved clinical trial on 10 years worth of daily supplementation of CBD to see what the negative impacts are? The answer yeah. is no. We do know, and, and this is another reason why I recommend that cycling, right? Is, is that why take something every day that you don't have to? Yeah. You know, cycle off of it. And if you don't need it anymore, then don't take it. If you find that you do need it, go back on it. But just that cycling alone is going to allow your body to reset. So we don't have to really fundamentally try to understand what it's going to do to take this product every single day. Gotcha. Yeah. Very, very good point. Um, Last question. Is there anything that we didn't talk about that you think that we should have as regards to CBD or anything that you're doing right now? Oh God. Um, not that I can think of, but the thing about CBD is it's such a wide open topic, right? I mean, we could spend days talking about it. Uh, yeah. You can spend days just going into the science and what the potentials of all of it are. So I, I think my big thing for your listeners is if you're interested, definitely try Omax Health. Uh, you know, that's a great product that I'm very proud of, but just make sure that you're doing it intelligently. You know, make sure that you're doing it for a reason too. Like if you wake up in the morning and you've had the best night's sleep and you're always like that, you don't have stress. Maybe you're a professional surfer and like you literally have the chillest life ever maybe cbd is not for you one of the big issues with the supplement industry is because it's capitalistic driven is we're constantly trying to push pills down people's throat when you don't need it so the other thing that i always recommend and whether it's cbd whether it's fish oil whether it's hell vitamin c is find a good practitioner a good naturopathic doctor or a progressive medical doctor who's going to look at your lab work and and evaluate where you're at in your life and say yeah, that makes sense for you. Or no, that doesn't make sense for you. Maybe you should try X, Y, and Z. So it's all about understanding your body, optimizing your body, and then reevaluating every six months to say, yeah, okay, I did this for six months. Now I'm in this position. I need to look at something else. Yeah, our bodies are really cool chemistry sets. And if we listen to them and we use relevant diagnostic data, you know, I, I, it's really fascinating what we can do to optimize our performance, our longevity. I mean, hell, telomeres become a great conversation right now. It's how do we keep our telomeres longer so that we can possibly, you know, looking at living to 100, 150, 200 years old. It's, it's exciting right now, but it's also, you have to, you kind of have to wade through all of the white noise and all of the BS out there to find out what really makes sense and what really makes sense for you as an individual. Yep. Yep. Very cool. Well, make sure that everybody checks out Evan's uh, supplement company at omaxhealth.com, correct? That's it. And uh, is there any place that they could go and follow you? Uh, You know, uh, Evan underscore DeMarco on Instagram seems to be the place where everyone's hanging out these days. Um, uh, I I still have a MySpace page, I think. Uh, (laughs) Uh, I, I'd give Facebook, but I swear, no, no, I, like I haven't had any interaction on Facebook in months. I don't even know if anyone's hanging out there. So Instagram seems to be the big spot. Um, also life to the max blog. If you just Google that, you'll find a lot of the articles that I'm writing, a lot of the stuff that we're working on, uh, just some new cutting edge research and, and just some great topics of conversation to, to help improve your health and wellness journey. Cool. I love it. And uh, for those of you listening while you're driving, I'm going to put these in the show notes at all around slash 159. So, but Evan, thanks so much, man. I really appreciate your time. That's been very informative stuff we had today. And uh, yeah, if there's ever anything that I can do to help you out, let me know. No, thank you, Joe. I appreciate it. We'll, we'll get you off some samples. So I'd love to, love to hear what you think. Cool. All right, man. Thanks. Thank you. Hey guys, thanks for listening. That was my podcast episode with Evan DeMarco of omaxhealth.com. Highly recommend that you check out his site at Omax Health and maybe give a try 
to any of his products over there. I know I'm going to be doing that for sure. Let me know if you have any questions for myself or Evan. You can drop those in the show notes at allaroundjoe.com slash 159. That's allaroundjoe.com slash 159. And we'll get those questions all answered up for you. And make sure you check out Inside Tracker at insidetracker.com using the code all around Joe to get yourself 10% off, get your body super optimized and making sure that everything is in tip top shape on a regular basis. And if you need to sleep better, like most of us do, check out recovermattress.com. Use the code all around Joe there to get yourself 50% off and start sleeping better today or as soon as the mattress shows up, you know, you know what I mean? All right. The All Around Joe Podcast, where we optimize your human performance from my personal experience as an athlete, coach, and all-around self-improvement.